Walsh. Okay, right on. Hello, and welcome to Talking with Famous People. I'm host Eric. I'm here with host Zachary and famous person Hamadou. And we are going to talk briefly about the exciting world of evolution. Evolution. The other night we were talking about it, and I said I was not a big believer in evolution. And I didn't think it explained things very adequately, uh, given given lots of details. And one of the reasons why I didn't think it explained things adequately was, in fact, the story that's referenced in this article. I don't think I mentioned it the other night, but it was in my mind about the moths that changed to black moths from white moths from a short period of time. Uh, back when the Industrial Revolution happened. So this article, the part of it that I want to uh, most to pay attention to most here is this one. The peppered moths, oh wait, the study also confirmed that the cortex shift, this is a grouping of genes called the cortex that they're referring to here, was not caused by coal and smoke output, but rather in line with it, allowing the previously light-colored moths to blend in with their newly sooty surroundings to avoid predators seeking an easily identifiable bright white meal. The peppered moth's microevolutionary changes helped it hide, but researchers investigating the cortex effect in Heliconian butterflies a long-winged genus native to the Americas found that the gene pushed the insect's wings to become even brighter and more colorful to avoid predation. Uh, Helicoconian's famous capacity for mimicry is also limited to, linked to cortex, say the researchers who were surprised by the gene's versatility. This is highly unexpected, both because the butterfly and moth polymorphisms appear very different to the eye, and because the species are separated by over 100 million years. What this suggests is that the cortex gene is central to generating pattern diversity across the Lepidoptera, and more generally, that adaptive evolution often relies on a conserved toolkit of developmental switches. Former investigations into butterfly and moth color coloration had ignored cortex as the gene was thought to control only cell division unrelated to pigmentation. With cortex's evolutionary role now revealed, the gene is due for closer examination. It's difficult. It's a different gene to the one we might have expected, and we still need to do more to understand what it's doing. Um, the discovery raises a fascinating question, says Dr. Jiggins. I like his name, Dr. Jiggins. Given the diversity in butterflies and moths and the hundreds of genes involved in making a wing, why is it this one every time? I'm going to phone call. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, how do you got any thoughts on that? Well, sorry, I wasn't on this one. Oh, okay. Well, basically, it's it's an article about uh, butterflies and their evolutionary, their ability to adapt faster than evolution accounts for. And it talks about, I'll send you a link here to the article. I'll probably the smartest way to do this. If you scroll down to the bottom of the article. Wait, um, does that have to do with, uh, like, the moths during, uh, like, the Industrial Revolution? Right. Okay. So if you check out that article down there, I read out loud a second ago for the audience, I read out loud the bottom uh, about three or four paragraphs of it. Uh, maybe five paragraphs. So that's the part that tells the part of it that I think is interesting. What was the question again you asked me? Or did you ask me a question? I didn't. I, I sought some feedback from Hamadou, and he is now reading the bottom part of that article that I put in the chat. I read the part, bottom part of the article out loud. And basically it says that these, these, these you know, you, the moths changed color faster than evolution could account for. How could the species of moths go from being all white to all black just because they stood around so quickly if evolutionary processes were um, as we've been taught they are, basically? And, in fact, they're not as that we've been taught they are, is what these butterflies suggest, that there are genes, or a gene, the purpose of which is to produce mutations and adaptations in response to changes to the environment, almost as though it can tell that it needs to be black, you know, which is crazy and doesn't make any sense. 
What makes perfect sense? The gene, the dApps. But how does the gene Could know? have been that uh, the black gene already existed. But how did it know it needed to switch? How did it know it needed to switch? I don't know what it didn't need to switch to red or green or yellow. No, it didn't switch it. Um, the the black moths um, survived more than the white moths. That's not. That's what this article says is not the case. That's not what happened. Is oh, what this no. article says. Uh, let me. What's the so? It's like there there are two moths. There are different colors, and then what? one of them changed colors due to right. this gene. Is that what the article is saying? All right. Well, the original story comes from the 1800s. There was a species of moth that lived in these trees in England, and it was a white species of moth. It was white colored because the trees were white. But then when the Industrial Revolution came on, there was so much soot in the air, the trees became black, and the moths changed to black moths. And it was, it's been held up as an example, perfect example of how evolution works. See? Except when people started scrutinizing it, the question was, but there wasn't enough time for genetic mutations to account for this whole species changing like that from white to black within the course of a few years. Doesn't make any sense. Well, this article attempts to explain what happened. Okay, so what yeah, question? Based on, based on the article, they were saying that uh, the white moths actually change color. Right, like a chameleon, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so so they didn't change species at all. So it's not an example of evolution at all, right? Um, well, it'd be an example of adaptation, which is what the yeah. is. Well, the, but here's the thing: it's another interesting example yeah. of of a species being endowed with traits it doesn't need and won't need for thousands of years. So these white moths, right? It's a conserved gene. These white moths never were white moths for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, because they lived in these white trees. They never right. needed to change color. And then all of a sudden when they did, they had this conserved gene from 100,000 years ago, they say. Or maybe it said 100 million, I don't remember what it said. But one of those two. And, uh, and they, all of a sudden they were able to utilize it. Because they needed it. Right. What the fuck? Does that make any it sense? It could be a anybody? gene that's triggered by the environment. I don't understand. Wait, I don't understand what, like, the... I don't think I understand what you're, like, surprised about. Like, it's this, or, or is it the surprising fact that there was a gene that they didn't realize adapted, or... No, I mean, the thing is, the notion that there's a gene responsible for producing more genetic mutations in order to produce evolution is something I'd never heard before. Now, you might, you might say, well, that's not actually what this says, Eric. It actually says that it produces adaptation in the moment, that these things are not changing generationally, that the individual moths are changing. Except, interestingly, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't take long enough for us to just explain it through the traditional Darwinian evolution model of natural selection, but it didn't happen fast enough to explain it like a chameleon would. Like, you know, a chameleon lizard, you can see it change colors as it changes, goes near something, right? So that's, that's real-time adaptation. And we know about long-term genetic adaptation. This middle ground thing is not something I'd be, been familiar with and seems a significant challenge to the model that we've all been raised to think is the existing evolutionary model. Is it a significant challenge or a challenge or is it a new new addition? I mean, what's it what's it challenging exactly? It's Lamarckian. It suggests somehow that the species knows what it's gonna need to to do in the future. It's like, you know, Lamarck had this well, theory it, of evolution that said has... Lamarck's theory of evolution said the reason giraffes have long necks is because a lady giraffe stretches and stretches her neck um, for leaves, and it's a little bit longer. And then when she has a baby, now its neck is a little bit longer because the mom's neck is a little bit longer because she stretched it so much. Well, Lamarck, that doesn't make any sense because just because I it won't we thought we thought it didn't make any sense. Just because I stretch my arm longer doesn't mean that my child's going to be born with a longer arm. It's not connected to the genetics. But as a matter of fact, um, there is a Lamarckian influence on uh, 
uh, genetics. We know that. We've determined that now. But it, it's 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 limited in the moment to like, well, people damage their genome when they do drugs and then this happens or that happens. But they also show that um, it impacts a child's genetics if a, par if a parent is depressed a lot. So this Darwinian model that was taken as the correct one to the exclusion of the Lamarckian model, that exclusionary correctness has already been removed. But this thing further hammers the nail into the coffin. Wait, now is what aspect again to the coffin? So I, I'm this, the, the primacy of Darwinian evolution as a model, which we've, which we've accepted as fact more or less for the last 50 years or so without a lot of fighting about it. But my point um, is that... The, well, the, I think there's been plenty of fighting about it. But, but it's from, it's from religious it's people. It's not from, from it's not from my angle. My angle is it's wrong, not because it conflicts with somebody's religion. My angle is it's wrong because it doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't understand how you're drawing from this one particular instance that the entire model should be discarded. No, I mean, I explained a lot of my reasoning that has nothing to do with this instance the other night in that video. Where I, I mean, my, my reasoning is it fails to explain what it claims to explain. That's basically my reasoning. Darwinian evolution fails to explain what it claims to explain. We've never actually seen a split in species either, no matter how much we've genetically modified a species. Like dogs, little teeny dogs, massive, huge dogs, they can still breed with each other. So I mean, my point was there's lots of reasons why I don't approve, why I don't agree with evolution. But to me, so, this suggests that the genes have a way of knowing somehow how they're going to have to mutate in response to a given setting. That the mutation is not random. It's responsive in some way. It could be a gene that would just trigger... A, a gene that specifically is triggered by environmental factors. But how would it know what to do? Why, why is it... Okay, fine. It's triggered to do something random, I get. And then half the mods die from some random genetic mutation. Fine. I don't think. Is it? I don't think that's wait, what wait, happens. What, what do you mean by evolution being wait, random? So, wait, so wait. So let's say like if the mod, if the trees were white, then the mods would revert back to being white, right? Right, but not like a chameleon, not in a day or two. Wait, wait. Can I clarify? What do you mean by random mutations? What, what, I mean what part Darwin. Is random, exactly? Well, what is a mutation? It's a it, a gene expresses itself over generations as gene. P, let's say, or gene O or something, you know, um, mm -hmm. gene O, P, A, B, and that's how it expresses itself generation after generation, and all of a sudden now it's O, P, A, C, but it could be O, P, A, D, or it could be O, D, A, C, or it could be O, 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 I mean, the mutation's random in that sense, right, a mutation, if you, if we create a mutation artificially with radiation, um, we're not going to get a positive, we're not going to get superpowers, Despite the comic Hold books. Hold on one second, sorry. I continue though. Amadou, thoughts? No, uh, like I agree with you. Like, uh, isn't isn't a mutation just a, a random change in uh, the gene sequence? Supposedly. So how could you have a gene that that directs mutation to be responsive to environmental changes in a way that's efficacious? Yeah, that's, that was weird. Yeah, okay. I have to go get another uh, beverage here. So, um, I'm going to stop this video so we don't have... Unless you all want to pontificate about this in my brief absence, in which case I'll leave it rolling. I'm okay. <laughs> You're okay? Does that mean no? Okay, yeah. right. All right. Thanks for watching this this short episode of Talking with Friends. People, 15 minutes, clocks in. Oh, okay. wait. Dakri's back. You want to continue this talk on evolution? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I have yeah. to go get more liquid. I'm dying of thirst here. What, what did I miss while it was gone? What was established? No, we were talking about uh, how mutation is uh, random. I'm not understanding the random mutation thing. I don't think I have a good enough understanding of it. What, is it, what does it mean? I mean, like, mutation is different from adaptation, right? Yeah, mutation is technically just... The, it's technically random because it's just a change in the, the gene sequence. So whatever whatever uh, trait that you get 
it could be positive or negative, it doesn't matter. And if that trait is adaptive, then the species will take on that adaptive trait. And that will change their gene? Or that will change no, like, for, So a mutation starts from like a single individual that has a change in their gene sequence. So they have a trait that is specific to them. And then uh, if that trait is, adapt is adaptable in the environment, then it's basically spread. So like that, per um, that species, I mean, that organism's line uh, continues to exist. And then uh, species, I mean, organisms that don't have that trait um, over time die off. And then the new, the new like gene order is the one that's adapt, or the the one that's maintained, right? Sustained. Yeah. And the new gene order would be random, right? Yeah, like it it comes. It's not random, but um, the first per the first organism to have it had it randomly. Right. And Eric is saying that. Like, the thing is, like, I don't understand like what his question is. Though. Yeah, that's what I don't understand either. But, like, I don't. How is this the nail in the coffin? I don't know. Hopefully, we can get his explanation way back. Like, it seems to me the only thing this identifies is that in the in this uh, in the species of moth that there was a a gene that um, was mutated in the short term as opposed to the long term, right? Yeah, or it could just be specific to these moths. <laughs> yeah. Like it doesn't, like I don't see how uh, it destroys the model. The evolutionary model. Yeah, I, I don't see how it either, but we'll, we'll see. Either place Alright. Alright, so from the article, so basically what it's saying is let me let me understand your position. You're saying that because there was an identified gene that w was able to be mutated in the short term uh, uh, as opposed to like a long term mutation or uh, that it disproves the original Darwinian model. Is that well, I don't think it disproves it, but I, I'm saying that I've long contested the Darwinian evolution model as being unproven, um, that those missing links, quote-unquote, that the, the fact that there's a fossil progression that appears to show, like, progressive stages of things, it doesn't prove evolution. In fact, if it did, it would well, suggest well, that wanna, the, the, the earlier stages of things point. wouldn't exist, you know? Hey, Eric, do you believe in macroevolution? Well, what do you mean by that? Like, on a grand scale. Like, where do you think uh, organisms came from? Where did organisms come from? I don't know. Like, how, like, how do you think they, uh, they progressed throughout time? I don't know. But... It's got to be. It's got to be in leaps, sudden leaps. It can't be what they say it is. It can't be a slow change over time. It doesn't make sense. Why would one no, one like, individual? Might, that makes more sense than sudden leaps. But okay, why would one individual within a species has an advantage? The, the chances of that advantage being so substantial and playing out so that it's represented in the species as a whole and changes the species as a whole into a new species, while simultaneously leaving the previous species alive. Um, because it's not like all the species evolved, right? That's what the whole idea is. Well, this is a, this is a missing link between this creature and this creature, which shows like, first they were all this creature, then they were this creature and this creature, then eventually they were this creature, this creature, and this creature, and there are three distinct species now. And this happened, you can see that, that this came from this, and then this came from that. But the point is, keep, given the... Are you sure keeping, there are missing links? Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's yeah, not... missing links between, like, uh, the first organism and how they 
came from uh, like single cell organisms. I mean, it, like single cell my, organisms. Basically. I shouldn't have used the word missing. They, my point is the links, not the fact that they're missing. I'm not. I'm not objecting to any missingness. I'm only concerned about the fact so that there's a link. What traits are you unsure about? Like how? What 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 traits would you identify that you you claim they have to be like a leap development as opposed to a gradual development? I don't think it's trait specific. I think it, it comes from number one. Think about the way that organisms actually interact. So if I suddenly develop a mutation, let's say that gives me the power to create thunder with my hands or something and it gives me an advantage I get all the chicks in the world I'm not going to change the species I don't care if I have 5,000 yeah, children offspring, yeah but your offspring are going to be are going to have an advantage though so they're going to like their future generation is going to survive okay I understand that that's, that, that's the theory chance. I get that I understand that that's the theory and I also understand that um that in fact, we can see plenty of examples of specific traits associated with specific genes and see how those genes transfer down from parent to child. Nobody's disputing genetics. I'm not disputing genetics. What I'm saying is what we have yet to ever see in the history of the world, despite our best efforts to make it happen, is the successful creation of a new species. Well, I'm reading right now on one of the frequently asked questions about evolution about one species turn into another, and here's the response. One species does not turn into another or several other species, not in an instant anyway. The evolutionary process of speciation is how one population of species changes over time to the point where that population is distinct and can no longer interbreed with the parent population. In order for one population to diverge enough from another to become a new species, there needs to be something to keep the populations from mixing. Often a physical boundary divides the species into two or more populations and keeps them from interbreeding. They're separated for long enough and presented with sufficient... Yeah, I get the idea of it. I, I, I'm, this yeah, is, I, I understand that model, fine. But my point is, if that's the case, why is it that a Chihuahua and a Great Dane can still mate? It, they, could be not, they could be hardly any more differentiated from one another. It doesn't, they've been kept separate as breeding lines for generations, countless generations. Why aren't they yet a separate species? Well, let's Google it. If you if differentiation between species over time causes them to become distinct species who can no longer mate with one another, why can Chihuahuas and Great Danes still mate with one another, despite the fact that they're vastly hugely differentiated from one another, and yet they're still the same species? So why can, why can two dog breeds mate? Is that your question, basically? Why can, if, if, dip, if over time species became different because of some genetic mutation, because certain genes were prioritized over certain other ones, like a chihuahua has certain genes or genetic combinations that, um... That, um... I had to mute you, Hammond, because you're, you're getting too much background noise from you um, for a second here. Uh, there, if, if in fact, you, if you say, you say, okay, well, let's take these two dogs, two strains of dog, these two populations of dog, uh, pre-domesticated dog, let's split them into two areas and let's let them develop separately for a long ass time. Why would that make them two separate species, but intentionally doing that? vastly more than could ever happen naturally why is it that that um, wouldn't change our, it? but I mean a chihuahua and a what was the other example a great thing great name still the same species aren't they they are well why are they still the same yeah species? that's what I was thinking too no, there's a difference between genotype and phenotype. I, I know, but are you saying that there's no genetic, the, the, the huge phenotypic differences don't represent a genetic difference? No, they might they might have the same uh, the same gene structure and the same genes essentially, but uh, the, how the genes are expressed are different. That's okay. Like 
Okay, so what makes it different? How do you get? How, can we make it a different species? Is there some way we could do that? I mean, I, I mean, like we, we, be better we can do that artificially. So, like, uh, for example, if we take like a dog that has a specific, a wild dog that has a specific mutation, and we separate, we separate that dog from the rest of the population. Eventually, isn't that what we do when we breed dogs? Isn't that what we do when we breed dogs? Oh, they have that really small one. It's got a weird mutation. It came out really small. Let's keep breeding that one and those ones. And we're trying to handle that gene. Isn't that what we do when we breed them? Wait, sorry, I didn't hear you. Isn't that what we do when we breed them? I mean, I feel like if I answered any further, then I would just be speaking from a place of ignorance. Like, I, I'm, I don't have enough developed understanding of biology, but speculative that's, rhetoric uh, is not ignorance. Speculative rhetoric is how one attacks ignorance. Um, well, I still, I don't know enough about the subject to respond. All right, what do you think, Hamid? I feel like, but my, but, but, but one last thing, my. I, I feel like all the the questions you have come from a mis uh, information of of the evolutionary process overall, and that it could easily be answered if you consulted someone like, such as an evolutionary biologist. I don't agree. I'm what I wait. I wait. I can totally be convinced. I'm totally convincible, but all the answers I've had read and ex heard explained all say. Uh, unsatisfactory responses and in fact in that article there the person says oh, we really need to rethink our uh, uh, yeah yeah I just looked it up um, the reason why the different dog dog breeds can uh, still mate with each other is because the chromosomal structure is still the same it's, they have the same amount of chromosomes okay so no, it's not what, the genes so okay but then in fact didn't you just disprove the thing you read to me before What? What was this proven? Well, he re the thing he read before, which said, "Oh, this is how it happens." It's just a description of Darwinian evolution that the, the mutation occurs, and then they they stay distinct for a period of time until they can no longer mate with another one another, and then they're a new species, right? Right. But but we see mutations in genes that doesn't cause a new species. So we're looking for only mutations in chromosomes. Now, almost every single chromosomal mutation that we can think of is a disastrously bad disorder. I, I can't answer. May I have a new? Yeah, uh, like, same, like, I don't know enough to, uh, to speak about it. That's what I'm saying. Like, this isn't the best environment for you to seek answers to your... Evolutionary I'm answer. not seeking answers. I'm seeking to blow up existing answers. <laughs> well, if you can't, well, the way I look at, at I mean, it seems with the uh, the amount of information we have, it's the uh, the best sort of theory we have to explain how life has developed over time. And even if you can, I mean, it's you can point out parts of it that are unexplained, but. Um, if I mean the job is to provide a better explanation, you know, and right now this is the current explanation we have because it's all the evidence point, seems to point. To. Well, but I say the better explanation is that somehow genetic cortexes, like the one they're talking about here, um, that they actively direct mutation by knowing somehow what mutations required by environmental pressures, even though it makes no sense, you know. Pursue that. Let's see. It is more difficult to generalize about the phenotypic effects of these chromosomal mutations. If the breakpoints of the mutation divide a protein, the protein mutations may involve whole chunks of chromosome rather than single bases. A length of chromosome may be translocated to another place on the chromosome or be inverted. Whole chromosomes may fuse, as happened, as has happened in primate evolution. At least, so we don't know if they can fuse or not. We're, we've deduced that they can by the fact that we accept evolution as the fundamental model here, right? 
Chimpanzees and gorillas have 24 pairs of chromosomes, where humans have 23. In other cases, some or all of the chromosomes may, be, may have been duplicated. It is more difficult to generalize about the phenotypic effects of these chromosomal mutations. If the break points the mutation divide a protein, that protein will be lost in the mutant organism. But if the break is between proteins, any effect will depend on whether the expression of a gene depends on the position in its genome. Okay, so what we're saying here then is the only thing that might cause speciation is if the break occurs between proteins. Um, in theory, it might not matter whether the protein is transcribed from one chromosome to another, though in practice, gene expression is probably at least partly regulated by relations between neighboring genes and a chromosomal mutation will then have phenotypic consequences. A number of chromosomes making up a genome are shown opposite. Uh, an animation shows the different types of chromosome mutations. Uh, this plugin is not supported. Occasionally, a length of chromosome is inverted. Often a part of a chromosome is deleted. Sometimes large sections of a chromosome are duplicated. In translocation, a length is relocated. And in insertion, a section of chromosome is inserted from elsewhere. Those are the types of chromosomal mutation. I, I mean, uh, I, I can accept potentially the chromosomal mutation explains. It all answers my one question about the speciation of dogs. But is the is like the um, primate to man chromosome mutation? Is that the only one that was a fusion? That's the example they gave on that page. I'll I'll, I'll share the link with you. It's actually, no, that's not the right page. It's this one. Um, I was actually looking up uh, why different, do, like different dog breeds are technically still the same species because um, it's like from what I've read, uh, it takes like a, at least. Uh, like a relatively long time for speciation to occur. We won't even uh, I'm creating different breeds like for thousands of years. So it's too short. It's too short of a time for uh, speciation to occur. So, will we? Is there a specific moment when speciation actually does occur? Then can we say, okay, now this spe this individual dog is not the same species as that individual dog because this individual dog cannot mate with that dog. I mean, that's a no, binary thing. If we take thing. Like a Great Dane, if we take a Great Dane and we separate them for millions of years, speciation is probably going to occur. Okay, but, but what's, what makes them not be able to have sex with each other anymore? What's the thing that makes that happen? It will be a change in a number of chromosomes. All right, so it has to be a chromosomal mutation. So we're back to there. We can acknowledge yeah. right away that genetic mutation doesn't do it. And it doesn't matter how, you can say, well, there's not enough time. Well, I mean, the point is there's a mechanism and there's a point at which a species either can or cannot mate with itself and have a, have a genetically viable offspring. That's binary. It's not sliding scale. You can't say, well, they get a little bit less and a little bit less able to mate until finally they're not able to. That doesn't make sense. There's got to be a distinct reason, genetic reason, and you pointed to number of chromosomes, which means genetic mutation does not happen by dogs, but just with more time. It means it requires a specific change in the chromosomal structure. Okay, so we established that. What are you trying to say? That environment can't cause chromosomal... Uh, it can, but that's not the model that we've been taught. We haven't been taught about chromosomal mutations being the only mechanism by which evolution occurs. They're not the only, but... I mean... they, they are, though, apparently. That's my point is that I've yet to hear any answer to this. If, in fact, genes change species, then we've obviously changed enough phenotypically representative genes um, in dogs that that would create the species change. If you say it needs more time... Well, I mean that, like, during a chromosomal change that other traits would also be changed? I mean, <laughs> can't they both coexist? Yeah. That brings me back to my sudden leap point. Right? You can't have a gradual change to a chromosomal mutation. 
If I have a chromosome mutation in my baby, it's probably Down syndrome. It might be Fragile X syndrome. It might be any number of other awful mutation syndromes. Right. So your point is? So my point is, it's not gradual change over time. It doesn't make sense for species to gradually evolve like that. It makes sense for us to have sudden leaps from one species to another. It's not driven by natural selection fundamentally, but by a chromosomal mutation that causes shocking differences from one species to another, enough so, more so than a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, so that they can't breed with each other anymore. Mm, I mean, just because you can reproduce and like, I mean, because someone can be born with a chromosomal change and have like Down syndrome, I don't think it necessarily means that that's the only way, like, chromosomal. You, you, we have to, we have, you're, we're I stuck, would, with, um, we're stuck actually... with several things here, right? We need speciation, species, speciation, speciation to occur with, with requiring more genetic change than dogs or requiring chromosomal mutation. If it requires chromosomal mutation, then you're not talking about gradual change anymore. Because immediately they can't they can't mate with the other species. It's not like over time, right? If they're a different species. Uh, speciation can also occur um, through gene like reduction of gene flow. Which means what? Explain that to me. I'm uh, sure. I'll send you the link. Okay. I think I understand what your what your point is though. You're saying that like because chromosomal changes happen once uh like something is is reproduced, that that's an instant jump. And that the theory is saying that or the original model is saying that it happened over time, but you're saying that because it's a reproduction that it has to it had to be a leap, right? Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I see I, I see your point now. Um I think now I understand where you're where you're coming from. Um, okay. Well, I can't like. I guess I would have to understand how chromosome mutation happens, like over time, if it happens over time. But see, I mean, my my problem with evolution is that it it totally fails to explain so many different things that I don't understand why we default to it as a, as a satisfactory explanation for anything. Well, yeah, I think it's important to, to note that um, the reason it's prominent at the moment is because everything seems to point towards it, right? It's not necessarily like, I don't think it's set in stone necessarily. It's set in Except st I it's, just it's, showed it's, how it doesn't point to that. That's the thing. Is I, what I just said, it intuitively, logically follows from the, the things that we read that contradict each other. So I don't think it logically points to that. I think it points to something else well, entirely. From what, from okay, from what you tell me, that makes sense. But I am also not an evolutionary biologist, so there might be an explanation that I'm just not exposed to yet. Hey, or if you were an evolutionary biologist, you'd be so convinced and so operating within the paradigm that you wouldn't even be able to recognize the emperor has no clothes, which is what I suspect happens with a lot of evolutionary biologists. Now, granted, I think nowadays they're starting to look more seriously at this stuff that I'm saying about there being sudden leaps. And I bet if you were to Google sudden leap in evolution, a um, bunch of shit would show up. But my point is, I don't think we should prioritize their expertise over my reasoning. I don't think they should ever be prioritized over my reasoning. If they're really experts, they need to show me why my reasoning is wrong. And that's the only thing that matters well, I would, to me. I would think you'd have to, understand, you'd have to get their answer first before you could say whether or not it's something that's... I agree. I'm saying, in, given that it's unanswered, these challenges that are unanswered, there's no reason to embrace the claim. I mean, I don't know if they're unanswered yet. I, I just can't respond to that. I, I, I haven't. Know. They haven't been answered to me. Now, granted, you might say... Have you been, have you been seeking those answers? It's not my burden to disprove the claim. Well, if you're I, going to lay down claims like this, like that, it doesn't, that it, it is debunked. You know, I've debunked evolution. Like, no, I'm not claiming like I've word. debunked evolution. I'm claiming that evolution fails on these following criteria. That's what I'm claiming. I'm not claiming to have an answer. I'm claiming evolution fails on these following criteria. 
and those 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 accusations of failure of mine have gone unanswered. So there's no reason to accept the claim, from my perspective. You haven't seek answer to them because you say there wasn't your job to. I mean, my point is the thing claims to. If the thing says, "Hey, come if you buy my product, I will both cut your hair and uh, give you a massage, and it only cuts your hair," you go, "Your your product is lying to me, and it did a shitty job cutting my hair too. It only cut like three hairs." So, um, you know, you need to answer for your failure to meet your own claims. I mean, one thing that we've all been taught, and it's definitely a core notion of evolution, is that it's change occurring over time. And you know, I pointed out that there's contradictions implicit in that. Well, I don't think that, I mean, there certainly is change over time, right? But I don't know if that's, uh, I don't, I think the thing that you're concerned with can coexist. You know, I, I don't think it's, um, in contradiction with each other. You, but the dogs thing, the genetics and, and chromosomes thing, that's where the contradiction lies. Hold on a second, I see who, who just pulled up. I'm gonna go take a piss actually, be right back. Man, there's gonna be so much dead time on this video. <laughs> Come on in chat for a second. Alright, well. I hope you guys, you uh, more evidence minded folks, you more evidence minded NTs, prove me wrong about this shit. I'd be loved I'd love to be proved wrong. I like being proved wrong. That's fine. Um, but in the interim, I'm not gonna accept the claim because they it doesn't meet my criteria for uh, sit, proving what it says it proves. Yeah. And thanks for watching Talking with Fans, people.